Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to another video. My name is Dylan and I'm a cycling coach at CTS and pro mountain bike racer. And today I'm going to be analyzing my power file from the Croatan Buck 50, which is a 150 mile or 240 kilometer gravel race on the coast of North Carolina. I'll also be going into my fueling and nutrition strategy for such a long event. And there should be some take home lessons that you can use if you plan on doing a long distance gravel race or really any long distance cycling event for that matter. If you're new to this channel, I make weekly training, racing, and gear related videos going over tips and tricks that I've learned in my 12 years of racing experience that have gotten me to the top of the ultra endurance mountain bike game in the US and as a cycling coach at CTS. If you wanna learn how to get faster or just more about the science of training in general, be sure to subscribe and if you have a training question or a topic you'd like to see me cover in a future video, be sure to leave it in the comments section down below. I do my best to get to all the questions in the comments. Like I said at the beginning of the video, the Croatan Buck 50 is a 150 mile gravel race through the Croatan National Forest on the coast of North Carolina. And the race is pancake flat. However, potholes and a few blown out mud road and cornfield sections definitely make the race a challenge if the sheer distance wasn't challenging enough. And since the race is on the coast, the wind is usually a huge factor. The race is only in its second year, but has already drawn a crowd of 500 participants. It's pretty amazing to see so many crazy people in one place at one time, because let's face it, you have to be a little bit crazy if you're voluntarily signing up to suffer on your bike for that long. Let's get into the race and power analysis. Now, there are a few things that you need to know about the course before we jump in. The race consists of three 50 mile laps starting and ending at a miniature NASCAR track. The surface for the most part is finely crushed gravel roads with plenty of potholes to hit while you're pace lining in a group. There are a few freshly cut sections through cornfields and one of which had some pretty deep mud, but the race deciding section of the course is the infamous Savage Road. This is a three and a half mile section with massive mud bogs and ruts running through it. Riding this section requires constantly switching between the left and right side of the road to find the best line because you want to avoid the mud holes at all costs because they're a lot deeper than they appear. This is where the peloton usually shatters and the race splits into smaller groups. All right, let's get into some numbers. My normalized power for the race was 245 watts and my average power was 218 watts. This is a little bit lower than most of the races I do at this duration, which are typically 100 mile mountain bike races, but this makes sense because this was more of a road race and conserving energy here was key. The goal for me was to stay at the front to avoid crashes and the yo-yo effect that you get when you're at the back, but to rarely put my nose in the wind. If I did have to pull through, I made sure that I wasn't going over 250 watts, which kept me in zone two. Of course, I was forced out of zone two quite a bit to follow wheels during the race, but if I was on the front, I never intentionally went over zone two, unless it was in a critical section or at the final breakaway. What this did is it allowed me to go really hard when it counted. And if we take a look at my time in zones, we can see exactly that. The vast majority of the time is spent in zone one and two, just sitting in the pack conserving energy. However, the next zone after those that I spent the most time in isn't zone three or four, but actually zone six. So this would be VO2 max style efforts and above. I spent 34 minutes in that zone throughout the whole race. So basically I was either going relatively easy or extremely hard. The reason for this distribution is because at critical points in the race, I actively tried to whittle the front group down and make people tired. I never just sat on the front and gave my competitors a free ride. I also chose which sections I led at strategically. For example, I led every lap on Savage Road because the technical nature of this section made drafting difficult. If I was going hard in this section, that means everyone else had to go hard as well. Let's take a look at the power on some of these sections. On the first lap through Savage Road, I pulled and had a normalized power of 330 and an average power of 321 for just under 10 minutes. If we look later on in the lap, we can see a section where I pulled through the cornfield and had an average power of 379 for just under four minutes. With an FTP of 340 watts, these are extremely hard efforts for the middle of a 150 mile race, but they were purposeful. If we look at a section from where I was just sitting in the pack, we can see that my NP was only 206 and my average power was 197. And this is how the majority of the race was. I was sheltering myself behind riders, trying to put out as little power as possible to conserve energy. With about half the race completed, there was still a breakaway three minutes up the road. 
This is when I called on my friend Chris to help out with the chase. He had broken his frame and was going to call it quits, but I told him before you do that, at least get a good workout in for the day and get on the front and smash yourself to bring back those riders. And that's exactly what he did. We can see from the hour and 15 minutes that he helped with the chase, my normalized power jumped to 245. And this was in his draft. I wasn't helping him out with the chase. Remember that earlier when I was in the pack, my normalized power was just 206. There's no doubt that this guy is a strong dude and it's too bad that his frame broke that day because he was definitely on some good form. Entering the third lap, it was clear that most of us were tired and given that we had caught the breakaway, there wasn't a lot of incentive to pull. Given these factors, the normalized power for this section of the race was the lowest of the whole race at just 181 watts. At this point, most people had dropped off the lead group and there were only about six or seven of us left. I entered the Savage Road section with the intention of whittling that group down as much as I possibly could. I'm not much of a sprinter, so the more people there that could contest the sprint means my chances of winning were much lower. Through Savage Road this time, I had an NP of 305 watts, and by the time we exited the section, it was just me and one other racer, Jeremiah Bishop. Although within a few minutes, another rider, Michael Bassett, clawed his way back up to our group, and with 10 miles to go, the front group was three riders strong. It was at this point that I was starting to consider my options. Should I roll the dice and wait for the sprint, or make a late race attack to try to do a solo breakaway for the finish? In the end, I chose the latter. I noticed that Jeremiah's pulls had started to slow down, indicating that he may be tired. So when it was my turn to pull, I pulled much harder than I had been, and took a quick look back and noticed that a small gap had formed. At this point, I got into the arrow bars and gave it everything I had. Within about a minute, the gap had grown substantially. And with just 20 minutes of riding to go before the finish, there was nothing to do but give it absolutely everything. No more conserving, empty the tank. For the first minute of my solo effort, I averaged 422 watts, and then I settled into around 331 watts normalized power and 326 watts average power or 95% of my threshold for the last 23 minutes of the race. As you can imagine, after six and a half hours of racing, this is no easy feat. The majority of that 23 minutes was spent in the aero bars, which is what helped me to get a gap. If we do some quick calculations on bikecalculator.com, plugging in all my stats, we can see that aero bars would have saved me about three minutes and 20 seconds over being in the hoods and about a minute and a half over the drops. This is just over a 20 minute section and when the race is coming down to minutes, this is huge. A study on aerodynamics of a cyclist position used wind tunnel testing to determine that the TT position can produce a drag reduction on the order of 20%. Of course, this is nothing new. The benefits of the TT position are well known, especially for time trials, but at gravel and mountain bike races, they're still sparsely seen. For example, at this race, I was probably one of five people with aero bars out of 500 participants. Aero bars shouldn't even be up for debate on a course where you can spend a significant amount of time in them. If you're doing a race where you can spend more than 30 minutes in the aero bars, then you're throwing away free time by not having them on your bike. Dude, come on, aero bars for gravel? I read some article by Jeff Kabush and he said aero bars are totally not cool. You wanna know what's cooler than looking cool? Going faster, period. I also opted for a skin suit for this race for improved aerodynamics. The skin suit I used by Starlight Apparel had ample pocket space, which is great for long events because you're gonna need to carry food and tools. For my fueling strategy, I took a gel every 30 to 45 minutes, and I had a mix of Gatorade and water in one of my bottles, and then just water in the other bottle. Over the course of the race, I probably drank between six or seven bottles. It's kind of hard to count because I was losing bottles in the pothole sections. I also ate a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on white bread about halfway through the race. The white bread is important because unlike your day-to-day -day diet, which should be full of whole grains and high fiber foods, while you're racing, you wanna minimize the amount of fiber you intake because it can lead to bloating. Finally, at the last aid station, I chugged about half a can of Coke. Now, again, normally I would never recommend soda for your day-to-day -day diet, but it's amazing how good it can make you feel towards the end of a long race. For caffeine intake, I made sure that I had at least 200 milligrams of caffeine coming in through the gels that I was taking in throughout the race. Caffeine has been shown to have clear benefits on endurance performance, but only up to a certain point. A study published in the International Journal of Sports Medicine took nine well-trained cyclists and fed them 0, 5, 9, and 13 milligrams per kilogram body weight 
of caffeine before a cycling max test. All the caffeine tests performed better than the placebo. However, there was no difference in performance from the lowest caffeine dose all the way to the highest. So basically caffeine intake is important, but only up to a certain point. And this is only one of many studies on caffeine intake and endurance performance. If you wanna learn more about how caffeine intake affects your cycling, I made a whole video about it and I'll link it in the description below. Now, one thing I wanna point out is this was my personal fueling strategy for this particular race. What one person eats during a race won't work for everyone. A study on marathon fueling techniques stated that regardless of what research demonstrates or how complex a formula may be, each athlete must be treated as unique. Age, gender, total mass, lean mass, lactate threshold, VO2, O2 max, projected pace, projected acceleration, fatigue rate, temperature, humidity, sweat rate, gastric tolerance, and fuel product all affect fueling needs. And unfortunately, no clear universal formula exists to calculate such precise expenditure. Fueling needs can actually vary a lot from person to person, so experimentation is key. Whatever you go with, make sure that you've tried it and you know that your stomach can handle it. I'll definitely be making a video about how to fuel yourself for training and racing in the future, so be sure to stay tuned. So that's my power analysis and fueling strategy for the Croatan Buck 50. I hope you guys were able to take some of this information and use it for your own racing. Lastly, I have to say thank you to Gordon Wadsworth and Matt Hawkins for putting on such an amazing event. If you guys are in the Southeast area or you just like traveling to great events, be sure to put this on your calendar because you won't want to miss it. I'll leave the link for the race in the description below. Thanks for watching and if you like this video, be sure to give it a like, share it with a friend, and subscribe. If you're looking for more training and racing content, be sure to follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you want to follow my training, be sure to check me out on Strava. Finally, if you're looking for a coach, shoot me an email at djohnson at trainwright.com.